Okay, hello. Let's see, I got some people on. Awesome, you guys. I'm gonna have you, I'm gonna mute everybody just to reduce some background noise. And I'm just getting the screen set up here. Oh, it's so awesome to see people in person. Hi. <laughs> I love Zoom, you guys. This is uh so exciting. I, I used GoToWebinar before for a lot of my webinars, and this is the first time I'm using Zoom, so I actually get to physically see you guys if anybody wants to show themselves. Uh, so I see Jess on here. So feel free to meet your community members that have been that are here for the webinar too by showing your face, and we'll get started here in just a minute. Um, let me... Get the slide set up, make sure I can access. Oh, that's where did my go? Where did my Zoom go? Hold on. Okay, obviously I have to share my screen first. Here we go. Oh, this is so fun. I love it. We can see each other. Yay. <laughs> cool. Jess, can you hear me okay? Can you give me a thumbs up over there? Perfect. Thank you. All right, so at the end, um, we'll go over questions and I can bring you guys on live to talk about your questions if you want to, um, or you can type them into the chat box function. So we will do that as well. Let's see, I can see my Zoom. You guys should be able to see my screen. You can see me. I think we're all good here. So <clears throat> before we dive in, let me just say that um, you might want a a um, piece of paper and a pen, maybe something to write some notes with. I am recording the webinar today, so uh, I will send out the recording. You guys will all be guaranteed to get the recording. It'll probably, the link for it will go out on Thursday just to give me some time to download it and get it set up on the website for you guys, but take notes. And I'll just say that going into the, the webinar today too, like, at the end, there's going to be an opportunity where you can schedule a complimentary consultation with me. Um, that's something that I do standard all the time. So you'll have an opportunity. I've opened up some extra spots in my calendar for the webinar specifically this week. So I have spots that are available tomorrow, um, Thursday, and then I even opened up some spots on Saturday as well. Um, for these consultations as you guys maybe have some questions or want to talk to me more specifically after you hear um, what I have to say today. All right, so uh, let's jump in and we'll kind of start on time uh, <clears throat> since we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information that I want to share with you guys, so I'm going to do my best to kind of keep the information sharing maybe to 45 minutes so that we have plenty of time at the end to answer questions and kind of keep it to an hour. But I'm here to stay as long as you guys want to this evening with questions and stuff that you have. So let's dive into this. Uh, so obviously you guys know you signed up for this webinar. It's my free webinar, why typical blood tests don't tell you squat and what tests to run instead. And for any of you guys that follow me on social media, on Instagram, on uh, my Facebook page, you saw me post a live uh, video maybe yesterday with a perfect example of this. I posted an example of a client that I've been working with um, for the last two years, and we've been working on reversing her, Hashi her Hashimoto's and healing her gut and doing all of these uh, amazing things for her. And over the last two years, her health has been improving and everything, but, you know, she was recently going through some paperwork over the weekend, getting ready for to move, and she came across thyroid results from 2009, where she clearly had Hashimoto's, and it just was astonishing to me um, how this was overlooked, and I just want to say that you know, I'm not sharing this information with you guys to, you know, knock on any doctors that are out there or what's happening. I mean, it's just, this is, I think all of us are starting to know that our, our, our medical system is a little bit dysfunctional in a sense that it doesn't address chronic disease very well, um, or chronic states of illness or, or things that are progressing in the body are, 
our medical system is more designed for acute situations. I was just listening to Chris Cresser's, um, I'm reading his book, Unconventional Medicine, which I highly recommend for anybody on here. And he talks about this really well. So in sharing my client's results with you guys, and the fact that her Hashimoto's was overlooked in 2009, um, it's unfortunate that it was overlooked but her doctor probably didn't know any better. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why that might be. And she didn't know any better either, which is exactly why I'm here on this webinar with you guys today, because I just wanna create awareness about this to educate you all, to empower you to be more educated about what's, you know, what your lab testing options out there, what some of your blood tests might be saying to you, because you need to be better advocates for yourself. And that's part of when I work with clients, that's part of what I teach them to do is how do you be a better advocate for yourself? And then I help to advocate for them through that process, right? Uh, so I just want to empower you guys with information tonight. And that example of uh, those thyroid results was, or that situation with those thyroid results that just popped up, you know, over the last night or so was a perfect example. If you guys missed that video, um, you can go to my Facebook page, Holistic Health Boss, and ca catch that live video that I did about that yesterday. So let's dive into that, because or dive into this, because this kind of segues into how do you know if this webinar is right for you? I mean, this is going to catch all kind of for everybody, but um, oftentimes, like what the reason that I designed this webinar and came up with this topic is because a lot of times I am seeing people and um, who don't feel like themselves in their body. I see a little talk, a lot of talk about this on social media in different ways, or when clients come to me, like they just don't feel like themselves in their body, and maybe you can't quite put your finger on it. Um, you just know something's not right, and that's how I was for a long time. I was a personal trainer um, before I did this work, and I just for a while, like I just knew something wasn't right in my body, but I didn't know what it was. Um, also, if you feel like your energy is tanked and your weight weight won't budge, but you don't know why, um, this is a huge one that I come across with a lot of people. So I actually was meeting with a client before this, and this was kind of her story is that, you know, she looks great on paper in terms of traditional conventional medical statistics, but her energy is not great and her, her weight's not budging. And the example of Sarah, the client that I talked about yesterday on Facebook Live, like this was her also. So this is probably a lot of you guys. And in that case, if you're experiencing either of these things, like you probably have tried a lot of diets, just different exercise routines, different supplements. You've seen different health professionals, maybe chiropractors, acupuncturists, different nutritionists, different health coaches, personal trainers. I mean, the list goes on. And I see you, Jess. Yep, totally. And, uh, and sometimes you get results, but they don't last, right? And that's because there's some missing pieces that we're going to talk about. And in, in the work that I do in functional diagnostic nutrition, we call this the cycle of trial and error. Like you keep trying things, you get stuck in the cycle, there's error, like you're missing some pieces, right? That you've tried all these things. Maybe you've tried keto diet, paleo, Whole30, money, like spending money on things, supplements, this, that, and the other. And I, and it's kind of taking a shot in the dark if you're not doing the right testing. So testing, I always say test, don't guess, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. It's like testing to get the missing pieces, and then you can be more strategic and specific about the stuff that you're trying. Um, maybe some of you don't feel like yourself health-wise, yet your blood tests, like I mentioned earlier, kind of keep coming back normal. So we're going to differentiate the, the normal ranges today. And um, in some cases, I see people also who their health issues seem to be getting worse, even though they're quote unquote doing all of the right things. Um, so you're eating right, exercising, all, all the healthy things that everybody else is doing, but it's not working for you. Or maybe you're just somebody who wants to understand your health better and take it to the next level. So if you, no matter who you are, this webinar is going to serve you. And the things that we're going to go over today, the key things that I want you to take away with is we're going to talk about the difference between kind of 
blood and saliva testing specifically for your hormones and how they don't really give you the full picture about what's going on. And um, there's urine testing that you can do out there to look at your hormones much better. And that gives you a more full picture on how some of these tests can complement each other. Uh, we're also, like I mentioned earlier, going to differentiate with what's happening with lab reference ranges. So what's wrong with them, how they can be lying to you about your health. I mean, this is the classic case of my example client, Sarah, that I showed yesterday where her thyroid values were within the lab range, but that doesn't mean that they were actually optimal or functional. Um, we're going to take a look. I'm going to show you guys some examples of what's called a comprehensive blood chemistry panel. So when you guys go to your doctor and you get blood work done and they test everything like glucose levels, HB1, uh, A1C, thyroid, cholesterol, uh, white blood cells, red blood cells count, um, and some of the things that are under that nutrient values, that is called a, a comprehensive blood chemistry panel. And those can have clues about inflammation that's happening in your body, your gut health, and your liver health too, where the doctors might look at it and go, oh, everything like looks great or that's low or high, let's give you medication for that when I like to get to the root cause. So I'm gonna share some of those insights with you. And this then goes into why functional lab testing, not necessarily conventional lab testing, can kind of give you some of the missing pieces to your health puzzle. And we're gonna get clear on kind of exactly what you can do next to um, restore and rebalance your health and start kind of feeling like yourself again, all right? So without further ado, let's jump in here. I want to just take a moment to introduce myself for those of you who may not know me very well. Um, I'm Jen Maleka, the Holistic Health Boss, and I am a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, which can be a mouthful to say. Um, Basically what that means is I kind of fall somewhere in between a naturopathic doctor and a typical health coach. So I do more than typical health coaching because I run a lot of the same lab tests that a naturopathic doctor would run. Um, I just can't diagnose or write prescriptions. So I oftentimes will partner with naturopathic doctors whenever a diagnosis or a prescription is needed. Um, and I support the client on a more a frequent basis, you know, we meet weekly or every other week, we work on diet, we work on all different types of things. So that's kind of what I do in a snapshot. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And I got into this business as a personal trainer. That's where my original training came from. Um, I have my degree in kinesiology and fitness, nutrition, and health. And I also have training in transformational coaching, which is um, the kind of the study of neuro-linguistic programming. So I believe that you know, improving your health requires working in all aspects of your life. And that means like sometimes changing your beliefs to support the results that you want. So if you feel like you keep, you know, self-sabotaging in a way, it's like, why can't I stick to this plan? Why do I keep falling off track? Sometimes it's not your fault. Like there's a belief system that's running in the background. So I will work with clients and we kind of rewire the brain in a sense to have more supportive beliefs so that they can move forward. And that's what that transformational coaching is. So a little bit about my story and how I've been in your shoes in some respects is, Back when I was a, a personal trainer, I was the person who was doing all the quote unquote right things, um, but I wasn't feeling great. Like I was counting my calories, I was exercising, I was coaching and training clients on doing the same thing, yet I had my own internal struggles. I had a 4 p.m. crash, which was hideous. Like I would go to Starbucks and get a double Americano with of course, you know, low fat creamer in it. And I would still be struggling to keep my eyes open in my afternoon and evening training sessions. But every time I went to the doctor, I was the picture of perfect health, like my cholesterol numbers, my blood sugar, my uh, blood pressure, all that stuff always looked great. And even though all that looked great, aside from the 4, 4 p.m. crash, I started to develop more um, health issues. Like I developed allergies that I had never had before. I had reoccurring headaches, almost like migraines that would wipe me out. Um, I had a long history of ear infections. And I remember 
the last time I had a really bad ear infection was when we had the big, huge power outage in San Diego, which I think was probably back in 2010, 2009 ish, seven, maybe somewhere around there. And I was laid out on the couch for three days with a gnarly ear infection. And then I also had skin cancer at a really young age. So I had skin cancer at the age of 25 and it did not run in my family. So um, that means that it was purely a result of my environment and a factor of how unhealthy my body was on the inside. So I started doing research and I came across the Functional Diagnostic Nutrition Training Program. Um, I went through that program. As part of that program, you have to run a lot of these tests on yourself. So I resolved my own health issues. Um, I was doing great and totally coasting from like 2013 up until about 2015. And then I started gaining weight all of a sudden and I developed hormone imbalances. Again, even though I was doing all of the even more right things from my training at that time, like eating an anti-inflammatory diet, taking the right supplements and through the right testing, because I was more educated through my training, I discovered that I had estrogen dominance. Um, which was missed on the blood test. And um, I also had Hashimoto's and it was all kind of stemmed from having toxic mold in my house. So, but having the knowledge that I had through my training, I was able to um, figure this out, right? So again, I went through a process. I've been through a process over the last two years of healing myself from Hashimoto's, mold illness, estrogen dominance, and it's all through holistic lifestyle practices and approaches. And I teach clients to do the same. So I went into remission with my Hashimoto's within six months. I no longer take medications. I manage it totally naturally. All of my inflammatory markers from the mold illness is gone. I don't have estrogen dominance anymore. And I, I travel the world and I live a normal life and you can too. So I am on a mission to share what I've learned with all of you guys today to empower you guys more so that you can advocate for yourself better and take the right action. So let's talk about what is common is not normal. And you guys might've seen me posting about this, but this is the frequent um, thing that most of my clients or people that I talk to come to me and say, they say, you know, my doctor or my health professional of some sort, like ran all of these lab tests and everything looked fine, but I still don't feel like myself. You know, I just had a new client that came to me this last week, same thing, working with a naturopathic doctor, knows that she has autoimmunity and she's doing some things, but she just still doesn't feel like herself. She's not back to where she wants to be. So I want to empower you guys that to know that you're not crazy. <laughs> like if you feel like something is wrong in your body or your health is out of whack in some kind of way, trust that intuition. Um, because nobody knows your body like you do. And I have felt this in my body before. Um, and and keep searching for the clues and the answers. Like it, you're not crazy that you feel like something is out of whack, but maybe your health professional just isn't running the right test. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Or the results aren't being interpreted in the right way from the standpoint of what optimal health should look like. And, um, you know, I hate to say this, but there's a lot of health professionals and doctors out there that call themselves integrated or functional doesn't mean that they have some of the training that I have or some other functional people out there. Like there's not really a standard of the utilization of the word functional or integrated. So if you're running up against a wall with your health professional and you're not feeling like yourself, like I would encourage you to go out and search for maybe somebody else to work with or bring somebody else onto your healthcare team that can add insight to what you're doing because you know your body better than anybody else. If something doesn't feel right, do not ignore that feeling at all, right? Keep pushing forward until you get to where it is that you want to be. So why is it that it's that this happens though? Why is it so hard for us to find answers? Because this is, I could guarantee you, every single one of you that's on here, this is the frustrating standpoint, right? Like we go to these experts and we're looking for answers for them and they don't really provide us with great answers and it's hard to find solutions to the problem especially within the traditional conventional system, medical system but even out like in this sometimes in the functional world we run against the same obstacles and, and part of the problem is that 
on average, it and there's studies that show this, you guys, on average, it takes 18 years for new research to hit your conventional doctor's desk or even your functional medicine doctor's desk. And then you have to ask the question of once they receive the new research, are they reading it? And how long does it take them to change the way that they practice to integrate that new information, right? So that's a big piece of the puzzle. Like most of them are just behind the times. And there's a lot of people like myself that do this type of work where we are on the forefront of the new research that's coming out and we're trying to siphon that down to our clients. You know, the other problem that happens is um, the average doctor's appointment is 15 minutes in the conventional system in Functional medicine, even the average appointment is 30 minutes. So Chris Kresser, again, I was just listening to his book. He talks about this in that book, Unconventional Medicine, where even himself as a, a functional kind of acupuncture, naturopathic type of doctor, he recognizes the need for kind of health coaches like myself because him as the licensed professional does not have the time in 30 minutes to go over all of your results, talk about diet, all of these things. So you need probably somebody else on your healthcare team that can spend more time with you, give you like 45 minutes, an hour a week or every two weeks to help, you know, integrate the information and stay on track with what you need to do. Another thing that I think people run into and why it's so hard to get answers is a lot of these experts out there are um, or, or specialists in a certain area, right? So they're not looking at the big picture. You go to an endocrinologist that only looks at the endocrine system. They're not looking at how your thyroid interacts with your gut and your liver, or you go to a gastroenterologist that's only looking at the digestive system and not seeing how that's interacting with a thyroid problem potentially, right? So we have these specialists, and that's where functional medicine, like real people who practice functional health um, approaches or functional medicine or integrative approaches, we're looking at the network of the body is like this web and seeing how, inter how everything is interconnected and how it impacts and affects um, everything. So you want to see somebody who's more functional minded. Sometimes what's happening is you're testing the wrong things or not all of the right things. So I can't tell you, I mean, I'm going to use thyroid a lot, you guys, because it's a great example, but I can't tell you how many times people come to me with a thyroid test and they only ran like three of the you know 10 markers that you probably want to look at, right? So not they're not testing all the right things or they're testing the wrong things. They're looking at TSH, which is actually a measurement of the pituitary gland, not the thyroid gland. So you need this you know bigger picture of what's happening. And then probably like when it gets down to taking action on it is that you need a full scope health rebuilding plan that includes diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, supplements, not just one thing and not just one prescription because if we know that the body interacts and interplays with its with all these different aspects of itself, that means that not just diet is going to fix it. You have to heal all these other aspects of your life. So that's where you may be feeling stuck. It's like, Maybe you're trying just diet things, but you're not working on your sleep at the same time. So you feel like something's not working and it's not that it's not working. You're just missing other pieces of the puzzle to your health rebuilding plan in a sense, basically. So that's some of the struggles that we encounter. Now this leads into what do reference ranges tell us, right? Because this is another challenge that we come across is what are reference ranges? Like who the heck made these things up? And just because results are common, again, does not mean that they are normal. So we have a tendency to accept what is common as normal, but that's, that shouldn't be the case. Just because it's common, it's not normal. And again, the thyroid is going to be a perfect example of this. Um, so let's, let me define what lab referen reference ranges are for you. So the actual lab reference ranges, so like on this client's test results that I shared with you guys, so this says you know, the TSH lab reference range is 0 0.4 all the way up to 4.5. So that is the average highs and lows. So these re reference ranges were based upon the average highs and lows that were collected through the lab or the governing body that is setting the standard reference ranges. 
these values, these average highs and lows that they are collecting include the values of sick people and healthy people. So you really want to emphasize that these values include sick people, right? So those sick people are, or dysfunctional thyroid markers, for example, are either going to drive the averages up or they're going to drive them down, which is why we have this re really wide range. So lab reference ranges that you get do not reflect optimal levels. They do not reflect like, where am I gonna function at my best? Like, what should that range look like? That's not what lab reference ranges tell you at all. They just tell you the average highs and the lows that they're seeing, which includes sick people. So the standard thyroid reference ranges, again, are a really good example. So these were established originally um, based on people with thyroid dysfunction, not healthy people. <laughs> So they were looking at actually people with thyroid dysfunction. Um, in 2002, the National Academy of Clinical Bio Biochemistry actually acknowledged that the standard reference ranges were skewed, but still nothing has really been done to change them. Um, in 2013, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists narrowed the range slightly, not a lot here, right? So they narrowed the TSH range from 0.5 to 5 down to the smaller range of 0.3 to 3. And a little bit later, I'm going to share with you what actually optimal kind of functional ranges are. So they're making some minor adjustments, um, but there's people out there, other leaders that are in the industry that are running their own kind of like clinical trials, and there's a whole field in the functional world where we are now sharing this collective data and we are sharing it with each other to see, okay, where are actually, where are clients actually performing their best at? And there's some um, best practices for uh, lab reference ranges that we use based upon that kind of optimal level, like where do we function at our best, basically. So let's take a look at uh, the thyroid reference ranges for comparison, just how off or how different are these in terms of what's the traditional conventional range versus what is the functional optimal range. So we can see here, um, the first value is TSH, which is an example. So like I said, back in 2003, they changed that range from 0 0.3 to three. Um, but so that's a really broad range, almost like three points, right? If we look at the optimal functional range that most people are using that's shared in the functional kind of health world, the range is much smaller. It's going to be 0 0.5 to 2. So that's a range of 1.5 points, essentially, where you want to function at an optimal level. That's much different than almost the three points that we're seeing in a conventional standard. Same thing with free T4. So a much wider range here, conventional is 0.7 all the way up to 1.9. In functional, we kind of tighten that up to 1.1 to 1.8 is where we would like to see people. From a free T3 standpoint, this is where it gets even more tighter. Um, free T3 conventional ranges are 2.3 to 4.2. Um, functional standards or best practices are going to be more around like 3.2 all the way up to 4.4. And then the, the antibodies for thyroid as well. So TPO conventional standards are usually around, they want it to be under 35. I see, um, because I can't diagnose, so when I work with naturopathic doctors, I see a lot of them diagnosing um, anything that's higher than 10 for TPO antibodies. And then for the thyroglobulin or the TG antibodies, conventional standards, are usually 40 or less versus functional is going to be 20 or less, right? So very different, like the functional optimal ranges are always going to be tighter in their range because that's where we're going to function optimally. That's where we function at our best. So the functional range is considered what is ideal for your body. But I'll have to say here, like in two different circumstances, I also want to just add the caveat here that um, it's also very important to not treat the test results. You also have to consider the person. So this is where the example of my client, Sarah, that I uh, mentioned yesterday in the Facebook Live and Instagram Live video that I did, you know, her, even if the doctor had completely like overlooked and missed 
I don't know how this could have happened because the antibodies were in the 200s, so it should have been diagnosed even by conventional standards, but she was symptomatic. Like, she wasn't feeling good, and the doctor, like, literally wrote a note on here that said, thyroid level is quite normal. This means that the irritable changes are not from thyroid. So whenever, in the work that I'm doing, when I see lab ranges or when I get test results back, I'm constantly thinking, does this correlate with how the client's feeling? Does it correlate with how the client's feeling? Because any time that we take, we get a test, we are only getting a snapshot in time. So thyroid values can actually change like minute by minute or hour by hour. So when you take a blood test, this is only a snapshot. It's not necessarily how they look all the time. So if I have a client, for example, who um, maybe their, their free T3 is a little bit outside of the optimal range, let's say it's at like 2.8, even though the optimal range is at 3.2, um, but they feel great and some of their other thyroid numbers are pretty close to their range, I'll, I'll say that's great. Like if, as long as they're feeling great, there's no reason to quote unquote treat that with supplements or medication. Like... Um, if they're feeling well, that's awesome. Same thing with, I'm a good example myself of cortisol levels. So my metabolized cortisol, I produce a very small amount, but my energy is really great. And the way that I utilize cortisol and the cortisol patterns looks really good. So I don't need to take supplements for, for cortisol because I feel fine. So it's in, in both cases, if you if your labs come back looking quote unquote normal, but you still feel like crap, then you have to correlate back to the person. And then the reverse of that is if the labs come back not looking optimal, but the person feels great, then you've got to go with how the person's feeling too and not just be recommending, you know, uh, protocols and supplements and things like that that are going to cost them money if they're actually feeling well, right? It's not, it's not about treating the test results or the paper. It's about considering the person overall, basically. So my, one of my clients, Lisa, was a perfect case in point. Another example of this, uh, Lisa and I had been working together and we ran some, uh, some foundational tests um, and she was getting results, but the weight just wasn't coming off. So I said, great, like I always try to go through um, the person's doctor for lab testing whenever we can do that to get it covered under insurance. So I suggested that Lisa go to her doctor. I said, here's the thyroid uh, number markers that I want you to ask your doctor for. And her doctor ran the blood test, but she did not run all the thyroid markers that we requested. So Lisa decided to run the test through me so that we could get all of the markers. And um, we found there was confirmation that she had Hashimoto's and then she got a thyroid ultrasound done and we could see that the Hashimoto's had teared up some of, torn up some of her tissue. And um, she would still be sitting around with plenty with all these symptoms had I not like educated her or you know helped her to advocate for herself or been an advocate for her. So I show you this as an example of you have to you have to keep fighting for yourself. You need to find somebody that's like me or you need to keep fighting for yourself. There's plenty of books and information out there on the internet um, to help you understand this better. And, you, and don't just settle for anything less than what you deserve if you're not feeling the way that you want to be feeling. This is really important, right? So this just connects with going back to kind of trusting your body and deciphering your own symptoms. Like our body is communicating to us all of the time. We're maybe just not always listening. And I am, am certainly guilty of this when I was feeling really great in like 2013, 2014, and then going into 2015 when I had some health issues that were popping up, like I started grinding my teeth and I put on a little bit of weight and I, I kind of like in the back of my head was ignoring it. I wasn't really listening to what my body was saying, but when things start to change for you, these are symptoms. It's a way of the body signaling that something just isn't right. Um, in, and internally, like what's going on is that you have this army or this defense system who is sounding the alarm. Like that's what our immune system is there for is to sound the alarm whenever an invader enters the system or when there's something that's dysfunctional. So just, again, trust in your intuition. If something doesn't feel right in your body for you, then um, you, you want to investigate that. You want to follow up on that. You want to 
test and request the right kind of testing and get on top of this stuff because the longer that you let it go, the more dysfunctional the body can become, right? So hormone troubles are a great example. Like we want to talk about um, hormones in this regard. So this is an example of how like your symptoms can be basically far removed from the root cause in a sense. So if you look at this list of symptoms that we have here, so things like depression, anxiety, specifically low blood sugar, um, inability to handle the stress, dry skin or eyes, need for caffeine, headaches, crave salt, um, cold often, afternoon crashes, those aren't maybe things that you would commonly associate with a hormone problem, but they can totally be associated with a hormone problem. And that's because sometimes our symptoms are very far removed from what the actual root cause can be. So I wanna share with you guys what the root cause is. Um, and we're gonna get to that in a second, but normally, Whenever you have any of these hormonal symptoms, for example, what are you given? A Band-Aid solution, right? So you get an over-the-counter or prescription sleep aids. You do bioidentical hormones. Um, I was given birth control pills. I was on birth control for 17 years um, because at the age of 16, I had painful and irregular periods, and that was the Band-Aid solution. And, and I'm in my 30s, and I think that my generation is the first and like there's probably a spread of this generation right we're kind of the first generation that's taken hormonal birth control pills for extended periods of time um, so we don't know what the downsides of that are and it's not that's not the fix like if you're having painful or irregular periods that's a sign of a hormone imbalance right to begin with um, or you try random supplements viagra for men i just met with a client last night who's um, her and her husband, she's 28 and her husband's in like his early 30s and he, they're having infertility issues and they're, they've tested his, you know, sperm for, he has like low motility and things are happening. I'm like, it's not that your sperm just woke up one day and decided they didn't want to swim. Like <laughs> there's a nutrient deficiency. There's something on a cellular level that's happening. Let's get to the root cause because all of these prescriptions over-the-counter things, random supplements, like these are, these can provide short-term relief care. And don't get me wrong, if you're suffering and you need some relief care, then some of these things might be needed. But we have to start asking, like, what is contributing to the imbalance? So when you're talking to your doctors about whatever is going on with you or your health professionals and they say, oh, your thyroid's not working or this isn't working or something like that, Go back to that little two-year-old you. Remember in the, in the terrible twos, um, kids always ask a million times, but why? But why? But why? Why is that happening? Why would that be happening? Be that broken record player that's asking why. I want to understand why would that happen? Why would this organ or why would this gland all of a sudden just stop performing its job? That's not what our body innately wants to do. Our body wants to function and it wants to be in balance. So when we look at what is the root of all disease or dysfunction, it really boils down to two things, and this is stress and inflammation. So stress burdens the body, which leads to inflammation, and we're going to define what stress is, because stress is, just, is more than mental, emotional stress that we commonly think of from our jobs or traffic or relationships, right? But let's talk about inflammation first. So there's two kinds of inflammation. There's acute inflammation, which happens like immediately as a response to an injury. So if you roll your ankle, for example, um, and then it immediately becomes inflamed, that's the body's protective response to you know, uh, stabilize the ankle joint, to send in the immune system, and to repair whatever happened. So this usually will last, acute inflammation will last just about a couple of days. And then we have chronic inflammation, and this is inflammation that remains and it sticks around, it hangs out at a very low level, um, kind of constant response to some type of ongoing stress that's in the body. And when we have chronic inflammation over time, this starts to create an overly active inflammatory response, which will then lead to damaged tissues resulting in conditions such as leaky gut, 
autoimmunity, heart disease, arthritis, Alzheimer's, and so much more. So Alzheimer's, any of you guys that are out there, I hear a lot of people in their 30s and 20s now starting to talk about this because they're seeing their parents or grandparents develop dementia or Alzheimer's. Completely preventable, you guys. Like, we don't need a cure for Alzheimer's. It already exists. If we live a more anti-inflammatory life, then you can prevent Alzheimer's. And if you question what I'm saying, then I highly recommend you read the book by Dr. Karazian called Why Isn't My Brain Working? And he goes into this in great detail. It's a very thick book, by the way. It's also available on um, audio, which is how I like to get through books. But he talks about this. It's all centered around inflammation. And then we have this domino effect that will happen and cortisol is one of our hormones, which most people know is the stress hormone. And um, but cortisol is also the body's natural anti-inflammatory hormone. So when there's chronic inflammation that's happening, the body starts sending out, producing a bunch of cortisol, and this disrupts cortisol balance, which can then have a domino effect to disrupt thyroid, and then estrogen, and progesterone, and DHEA, and testosterone, and everybody, just like the dominoes, gets knocked down, right? So, um, and this, this chronic inflammation is caused by continued stress, right? So here, the, the, the number one root cause of inflammation is going to be chronic stress. And stress, again, we're going to redefine stress. So stress is any type of persistent or long-term burden on the body that will result in an inflammatory response. So most of us, again, think of stress as, you know, um, conflict in our relationship, work, those types of things. But stress can also be inflammatory foods that you're eating, um, either knowingly or unknowingly, like ones that don't agree with your body. It could be lack of uh, quality sleep, over-exercising when the body is already stressed out. It could be environmental toxins that you can't see, hear, or feel. Like those are silent disruptors all the time. Nutrient deficiencies. Um, it could be true genetic um, voids that you have. So if you do have genetic voids that make it harder for your body to function, that can cause stress. And then, of course, obviously, it can be the mental, emotional stuff that we typically think of, like trauma, finances, and relationships. So... This is just kind of a chart to show you how the systems of the body all work together. So in the center, we have stress and inflammation that's at the bottom, which can lead to hormone dysfunction, right? Because as I just talked about, inflammation will dysregulate cortisol and the rest of the hormones, which can lead to overall metabolic chaos. And then this is the domino effect that happens, and it starts to take down all of these other systems of the body, like carb metabolism, detox capacity, fat and protein metabolism, um, brain function, your um, bone and connective tissue health, like how you can regulate in, uh, inflammation, our pro-inflammatory immune responses. So all of this is very, very interconnected and um, playing together in this game of health that we have going on in our body. So if we can reduce stress and inflammation, um, then we can start to restore balance and function to the body, basically. So now you know that chronic stress and inflammation is contributing to your biggest health issues and concerns, um, or that that's some of the root causes. So let's see what's happening for you, if this is actually impacting you, and, and talk about some of the testing, right? So let's talk about hormone testing first and how blood and saliva tests, again, don't tell you the full story always, and what some of the secrets are that it can be hiding in your urine test that can fill in some of the pieces of your health puzzle for you. So true testing, when we look at true testing, you first of all want to see all of the values to get the big picture and to truly understand hormone function. Um, so we talk about cortisol, like we want to look at metabolized cortisol, so how much cortisol your body's making. We want to look at free cortisol, cortisone, for example, which is how much you're storing. Um, we want to look at free cortisol, which is how you're utilizing cortisol, like efficiently or not. And then we also want to look at DHEA usually, which is the ratio to cortisol, um, which shows kind of the ratio of, of the burden of stress that's happening on the body. 
Um, with thyroid, this can be some other clues. I'm including thyroid in here because this is such a commonly overlooked problem. But from a thyroid panel, at a minimum, there's more thyroid markers that you can get. But at a minimum, you want to look at the TSH, the free T4, free T3, and then also um, TPO and TG antibodies, so thyroid peroxidase and then thyroglobulin antibodies. And these are important because the free values particular kind of show us how much thyroid hormone is available to the body, and we can see the conversion of free T4 to free T3, which can give us some clues about gut health, liver health, and nutrient availability too. When it comes to looking at the sex hormones, to get the full picture, you want to see there's actually three different estrogens. So when we look at a blood test, normally there's just one estrogen that's showing up, but there's three different estrogens, E1, E2, and E3. Um, and we also want to look at the pathways of the estrogens to see how they're balanced. Uh, we also want to look at alpha and beta progesterone as well as total progesterone values, uh, testosterone to see if you have enough for your age or maybe it's being converted to estrogen, that can be a clue. And then androgens also, which are kind of metabolites or hormones that make up testosterone and DHA are broken down into these things as well. So we can get the full picture on this type of stuff. So looking at the different types of hormone tests and knowing the values that you want to look at, here's a comparative of the different types of tests and what gives you the most complete picture. So if we look at traditional blood tests, you can get total sex hormone values. You don't really get androgens usually. You don't get a 24-hour cortisol rhythm, and you can get all of the thyroid values. So you kind of, it's like you get 50% of the pieces when you look at a traditional blood test. And then we have a saliva test, which has been the gold standard for a long time until we have the urine test come about. Um, saliva tests give you more insight, so you can see that um, we can get total sex hormone values, we can get cortisol rhythm, we can't get thyroid, so again, it's kind of like you're getting 50% of the pieces or clues with a saliva test. And then we have something called the, the Dutch test, which is the newest kind of state-of-the-art testing for hormones um, that actually gives us a way bigger picture. So on a urine test, we can see total hormone values, we can see the pathways, we can see cortisol rhythm. It doesn't tell you thyroid hormone values, but it does give you insights about thyroid um, health. So based upon your metabolized cortisol and your 24-hour free cortisol, it can be clues about what is going on with the thyroid, whether it's hyper or hypothyroidism that's presenting itself. So overall, the Dutch test um, is the number one test that I prioritize for all of my clients. So everybody that works with me pretty much runs a Dutch test because of the bigger picture that we can get. We can see all the hormones. Um, we can see the metabolites, the pathways, and it's a very easy collection. You basically pee on a paper strip four times throughout a 24-hour period, and that's it. The other kind of um, big difference between, let's say, a blood test and a urine test is that a blood test looks at what we call bound hormone. So this is hormone that is bound up and it's not available for tissue. So it's kind of inactive hormone versus something, the values that we get on a urine test looks at the free hormone values, which is how much you have available for tissue, tissue usage. So like for myself, on my blood test, my estrogens kept coming back in normal range and looking low. But when I ran a Dutch test, I could see the free hormone values and I was estrogen dominant and my estrogen pathways were clogged up, which was a clue that my liver was not doing its job very well in excreting estrogens. So the urine test can be far superior. Now, sometimes when I run a urine test, I do then need to run a blood test to back some things up. Like sometimes we need to look at sex hormone binding globulin, and that's only something that we can get on a blood test, or we need to look at prolactin or something else, like the Dutch test will give us clues that maybe we do need to run a, a blood test to get some more information on what's happening. So the um, Dutch test stands for, Dutch stands for dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. So it's a much bigger picture. And I want to show you guys what this test looks like in comparison to like the simplicity of what you get on a blood test. So here are some screenshots of what we can see on a Dutch test. So 
Over here on the left-hand side, I was saying that we can look at metabolized cortisol. So this is how much cortisol hormone your body is producing. And then we can look at 24-hour free cortisol, which is how your body is utilizing it. Is it blowing through it? Is it using it really efficient, efficiently, like what's happening there? And then you can also see that this is the cortisol pattern. So this person's cortisol pattern was not very optimal. Like they started off their day really good. Their value is the red line, but they have this spike in the afternoon time. So there's some type of stressor that's happening there that we wanted to identify. Like we want the pattern to fall nice and in between in this gray area where they're going to feel their best. Now, as I also mentioned earlier, when we see really low metabolized cortisol like this and high 24 hour free cortisol, this can be a clue for hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's. So this might be an indication that the thyroid is sluggish and therefore the adrenals, like the body is adapting and it's blowing through cortisol to kind of keep up metabolism and energy because the thyroid can't keep up with its job, right? So in this case, when I see this type of pattern on a Dutch test, I will then, um, if I didn't run a thyroid test already, I will have the client run a thyroid test so that we can look at thyroid specifically. Um, so then down here, we have a screenshot of the free cortisone pattern and then the daily free cortisol. So cortisone on the left-hand side is how we store cortisol hormones. So this is the storage form. So this person is storing a lot of cortisol for some reason. Their body is like hanging onto it. It doesn't want to let it go. But we also see that their daily free cortisol pattern is really high. They're using a lot of cortisol at the same time, right? So the day, we can see the daily rhythm in both of these things. And when we can look at both of these rhythms, both of them are elevated, which is indicating that this person is probably adrenaline driven. So they're in fight or flight response for some reason all the time. Um, this type of pattern could be caused by insulin resistant or dysregulation. It could be caused by caffeine or it could just be caused by chronic stress. And we need to figure out what, the, what is contributing to the chronic stress. Is it you know, parasites, bacteria, environmental toxins, work stuff, like we want to figure that out. So you can see how many clues we can get here on this simple urine test for cortisol. And then let's look at some of the clues for um, hormones that we have here. So up at the top, we have uh, dials for progesterone. So we can look at progesterone and the ratio to estrogen. So with this person, progesterone was actually really nice and high. It's a little bit high. Um, usually I'm not too concerned about that, but what we can evaluate from progesterone is, you know, maybe poor sleep, um, if progesterone levels are low, it's lack of motivation, infertility that could be happening. Right below that, we can see the pictures of the androgens. So these are, you know, this is depicting the hormone pathway. We have pregnenolone up at the top, which then gets broken down into DHEA and testosterone and progesterone. Then we have um, the testosterone broken up into androgens. So the androgens can, can look at, can give us clues about testosterone and DHEA. Um, and it also can give us clues about sources of acne. So if I have clients, men or women, that are dealing with acne or facial hair or androgenic type of symptoms, we can look at their androgen activity. And then obviously we can see um, estrogens over here. So we can see this is E1, E2, and E3 that I was referencing earlier. And we can also look at the inner, so we can not only look at the individual estrogen values, so you can see this person had really high estrogen, E1 and E2. So this is estrogen dominance right here. Even though progesterone was higher, these estrogens are really high outside of the reference range and when compared to testosterone, which is kind of like middle of the reference range. So then we can look at the estrogen pathways down here, which is what these pie charts are. And um, this person, this, this image is a little bit blurry, but they are preferring what we call the 4-OH pathway, um, which is a pathway for cancer risk. So we can, like you would never be able to see that on a blood test. And so now we can work to balance the estrogen pathways, help to support the liver so that it can clear estrogen and we can prevent cancer, right? So if you guys have history of cancer, especially breast cancer, prostate cancer in your family, then um, taking a look at these pathways would be like a great clue for you. 
And then down here at the bottom um, left corner, the last thing I'll point out is methylation. And this is in relation to how do you convert estrogen specifically. So we can look at methyl methylation activity as a clue on about, about how well or how poorly you're converting estrogen and then if, or hormones in general. And if you're not converting hormones very well, then we can add in some supplements and things in your diet to support methylation activity so that you can convert hormones so much better, right? So I just kind of sum this up to identify hormone imbalances. Um, we want to kind of maybe run a Dutch test to see the bigger picture of what's going on. Based upon the clues on the Dutch test, then you can run a full thyroid panel or a blood test to get additional clues and kind of back that stuff up. And then based upon the information that you got, I mean, you saw the examples that I just showed you, there was clues about thyroid, clues about inflammation, clues about insulin resistance, um, clues about the liver not working, we can take action to reduce inflammation by implementing a more strategic approach to diet, sleep, exercise, supplements in order to support the function of the body where it needs it. And that in itself is going to help to reduce um, stress and to reduce inflammation, which helps to reverse like disease and imbalances overall, right? So that's kind of the you know, sum up the hormone testing, that's the action to take is like to look at this on a deeper level and get more clues and be more strategic about your approach, basically. So what exactly do blood tests tell us, right, is probably what you guys are wondering, like if there's these superior testing out there, like the Dutch test that gives us more clues, like what can I, what can I run through my insurance and um, what, how can blood tests be of help for us? Because they do give us clues um, about what's going on with the body. They just need to be interpreted from a functional kind of standpoint. So this is an example of a client's um, results here where they had that blood, that comprehensive blood chemistry panel done and they shared their results with me and I kind of plug it into a spreadsheet and we can see the different lows and highs that they have, right, on the different values here. So high cholesterol, high LDL are things that usually stand out to people. Um, but these high cholesterol and high LDLs can actually correlate with inflammation, insulin resistance, and fatty liver. So when I see these types of markers come back on a client, it all goes back to that reducing stress, inflammation, right? Correcting the diet. If they have insulin resistance, then they're probably consuming too many carbs or sugars. So we can correct that through diet. Um, fatty liver means like supporting the liver function. So this is giving us clues about liver function, overall inflammation. We also can see like some of these low numbers are giving correlations about vitamin deficiencies. So this GGT marker is low. This correlates with a B6 vitamin deficiency. Um, and then hypochloridia, inflammation. So this goes back to kind of gut health. If we think about, okay, why is this happening? Where is this coming from? And then we go back to supporting the liver. We go back to healing the gut. Um, we go back to improving nutrient absorption, which again is exactly what we're going to see on the second page of this, more of the same thing, right? So we have, um, these are some of the red blood cell count markers that we get here, so indicators for B12 deficiencies that are happening. We also have some of these, the monocytes and um, basophils and eosinophils. These are indications for intestinal parasites. So this goes back to gut dysfunction. And if you have parasites and bacteria for yeast overgrowth, guess what that's doing? It's causing inflammation. They're robbing you of nutrients. So we gotta go back to like what's causing stress inside the body and getting rid of these things. So um, I will have, when I work with clients, if they've had recent blood testing like this done, I will have them share their blood testing with me and I'll kind of plug it into my magic spreadsheet and we can look at this and correlate this with some of their stool sample results or some of their Dutch test results and see, okay, we have multiple clues that are pointing in the same direction that we need to work on liver function, we need to work on gut function, uh, we need to improve nutrient absorption, we need to correct the diet, right? And then we can start to reverse the imbalances that are happening, basically. So let's get clear. Um, I've shared with you guys like a lot of information and 
let's get clear. Like the big takeaway message is do better tests, don't guess, right? There's better tests that are out there. There's better ways to look at the maybe values that you already have in front of yourself. Um, if I were to recommend to you, like what kind of action should you take now? What kind of test should you be looking at? I would say that there's three to four key tests that I see commonly that almost every single one of my clients needs. Um, and that's looking at a full cortisol and sex hormone sex hormone urine panel, so running something like the Dutch test that gives you that way bigger um, picture about what's happening in the body so that you can see all the hormone pathways. Um, and then get, that will give you clues on maybe some extra tests that you want to run. I would consider a comprehensive thyroid panel for some of you depending on what you're dealing with. If you have history, any type of family history of thyroid issues, run a thyroid panel because it is so commonly passed down, passed down genetically and then lifestyle factors will trigger the genes to express themselves. And to make sure that you get a full thyroid panel that includes free T4, free T3, the antibodies, both antibody markers. Sometimes I have clients and their doctors only run one antibody marker and then we're missing a piece of the puzzle, right? Because um, thyroid rules metabolism and it's part of the endocrine system that all works together. And then definitely um, I would be running a stool sample test. So looking for parasites, bacteria, yeast overgrowth. Some doctors will run blood tests. They're just not great um, tests to be screening for everything. So I have my clients do a stool sample test and the markers. It's like three or four pages worth of pathogenic organisms that we're looking for. Um, stool sample tests can also give you clues about your microbiome, inflammation that's going on in the gut, reactivity to gluten and your immune system as well. And then along with that, oftentimes I like to run a, a liver test, which is actually a urine test that I do because if you have a lot of gut bugs, they're going to produce a lot of toxic waste that can clog the liver. And also, as we kind of talked about earlier, liver function is really important for hormone balance. So if you do have some estrogen balancing issues or thyroid um, dysfunction, your liver is going to play a role in that because it excretes excess estrogen. It helps to convert thyroid hormone as well. So those are the three to four key tests that I would definitely recommend that you guys take a look at and run if you're struggling with getting to where it is that you want to be or you want to take your, your health to a higher level, essentially. So once you run some of the t those tests, you know, what is the solution? So now you have all this information in front of you. So what do you do, right? Well, in functional diagnostic nutrition, we always talk about how the general principles of health will outperform specific treatments. And uh, Thomas Edison and um, Hipp uh, Hipp 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 Hippocrates, like all of the, I couldn't say that, I'm tongue-tied, you guys. Um, they've had, like, this has been something that we've observed through time in medicine. Like, Thomas Edison said that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest um, her or his patients in the care of the human frame, a proper, proper diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. We see this in Ayurvedic medicine. We see this in Chinese medicine. It goes back to coaching up function in the body. So the solution then is once you have all the clues is to figure out how to eat right for your body. So there's a difference between eating healthy and eating right for your body. That's what I always like preach all the time. You, quinoa is a great example of this, I think, is that a lot of people would consider quinoa a superfood. It's, you know, super nutritious, lots, it's protein. Um, especially vegan and vegetarians really like it. But for somebody like me that's had an autoimmune condition, quinoa is not right for me. It causes an inflammatory response. Or let's take a banana, for example. A banana is obviously a really healthy food. But if you are dealing with insulin resistance, those simple sugars in that banana is not right for you. So there's a difference between eating healthy and eating right for your body. Eating right for your body will include healthy foods, but not every healthy food is right for your body. You also want to work on reducing um, anything that stresses your body out. So toxins, gut bugs, uh, and you know, um, mental emotional stress. And it doesn't mean that you need to live in a bubble. It's just implementing some strategies to support the body and getting rid of those things. And then also just to reduce stress whenever possible. And then just to reevaluate yourself regularly so that you stay on track and make course corrections when you want to. The 
the road to optimal health is not a straight line. It's also, it's very curvy a lot of the times. And sometimes things will work for a while and then you need to step up your game and do something else or add something else in. This happens a lot. So um, it's just constantly checking in and making adjustments until you get to where it is that you want to be. So ultimately, now you guys know the truth, but maybe you're still feeling a little bit confused, overwhelmed, you don't know where to start, you feel like your health practitioners, professionals don't know this, they're not gonna help you. So I want you to know that, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm on a mission to share what I've learned with you and this is what I do, is that I'm here to help. So I specialize in, like I'm not an expert in like a certain area, I'm an expert in all areas. Like my specialty is just basically helping health-minded people like all of you guys that are interested in this and here and taking back control of your health. And I do that by giving you access to these, the right lab tests that we just talked about and resources. And there's a lot of, you know, information out on the internet. So how do we funnel that down and figure out what's right for you specifically so that you can find the missing pieces to your health and finally get back to feeling like yourself again or if you've never been there maybe for the very first time so when i work with clients um, i do three kind of basic things that most health professionals don't is i figure out first and foremost like what foods are right for your body so that it can function at its potential that difference of eating healthy and eating right for your body, we really dial that part in so you can start feeling better right away. And then the second part is we use some of this lab testing to uncover those hidden healing opportunities um, to understand a, a bigger picture of what's going on in the body, where can we implement different dietary strategies or supplements or sleeping techniques that are gonna help to restore balance based upon the information that we have. And ultimately, I teach my clients, the people that I work with, how to connect with your body so that any, you know, at any given time, you're able to identify the burden of stress and know what to do to take action to alleviate it. So like a good example of this, I was talking to a client earlier today and she travels for business. And so, you know, we talk about traveling. Traveling is very stressful on the body. There's toxins that come in play, there's radiation, um, there's crossing time zones, all kinds of things. And she is uh, a professional, she's a personal trainer that trains professional athletes like baseball players. So she's obviously very into working out. So I told her, you know, knowing that you just went through a stressful instance of traveling, um, doing a hardcore workout is just going to cause more stress on the body. So that's, that's what I'm talking about is being able to identify the burden of stress at any point in time and recognize, oh, I shouldn't do a hard workout today because I just went through this like stressful 24 hours. I should probably just go for a nice leisurely walk and then I can pick up my exercise routine tomorrow instead of trying, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, like forcing it to happen and not getting the results that you want. That's the definition of insanity, right? So understanding, like being able to connect with your body and know what it needs and make adjustments along the way is ultimately like just three simple things. And then aside from that, it's also the accountability and support that I give people that I work with. So as I mentioned earlier, Chris Kresser was talking about in his unconventional medicine that people like me that are more in the health coaching space, we are the key to the change of functional medicine because these licensed practitioners and doctors, they don't have time to sit down with you for 30 minutes to an hour on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis. Um, they need to partner with people like me that can give you that attention, that support and guidance and accountability that you need on a regular basis to keep moving forward. It doesn't work when you, you could have the most amazing naturopathic doctor in the world, and if you see them once every three months and you don't have that accountability and support, then uh, you're kind of left like, I don't know what to do. You fall off track, you self-sabotage, and you don't follow through with the recommendations, or you question why it's not working. You don't have somebody to talk to. So having somebody that you can meet with regularly and frequently is very, very important, right? So that's where I want to offer up help for you guys. Like I mentioned earlier in the call, I do complimentary consultations for anybody that comes my way. Um, I opened up some extra um, appointments in my calendar to, to 
kind of serve all of you guys that are attending the webinar. So if you are interested in scheduling um, a consultation with me, I call it a discovery session, you can go to my website here, holistichealthboss.com slash discovery dash call. Um, I have appointments that are available tomorrow, Thursday. I opened up appointments even on Saturday. I have appointments that are open next Monday. Um, and then I leave for Peru for about 10 days. But if I can't get you in before I leave on the 25th, then we can always schedule um, something when I get back after February 6th. So I think there's probably about, I don't know, somewhere between 10 to 20 appointments that are open up between now and Monday, basically. So I want to open it up to questions. I think that you guys can all unmute yourself, maybe. Um, the Zoom thing is a little bit new. Um, so let me maybe take down, I, I think I can see this better if I take down the slideshow just for a second. And Jess, did you have a question? Were you waving at me because you have a question? I put it in the chat. Okay. Oh, right. Well, you're on. So if you have a question, ask me. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jen. That was really, um, really informative. What are your thoughts on reverse T3 mm -hmm. and and the relationship between a very poor gut, I mean, even the person who's doing it all right, a very poor gut and kidney stones. Everything's related. <laughs> um, so my reverse T3 is, is very helpful, right? Because it's, it's showing the uh, in, in uptake, the T3 uptake. So when we want the the broader scope of the picture, those are going to be important values to understand what is happening with T3. Is it being absorbed into the cells? Is it not? And that will help us from a, a cellular like metabolic standpoint. Now, if reverse T3 is dysfunctional, again, it goes back to like, why is that happening in the first place, right? And so looking at when we see the whole thyroid picture, we can see how is T4 converting to T3? What is the uptake looking like? What is the reverse looking like? Is there antibodies? And we can have a better understanding. So I, a good example of this is I had a client recently who actually their free T3 was like insane, like through the roof. And we looked at some of those other T3 values and we could see that like the cells were oversaturated. She was on medication for T3 specifically and it was oversaturating the cells. So they were kind of like shutting down, like they were, they were not answering the knock at the door. They're like, no more, you know? So that's where reverse T3 and T3 uptake can be really helpful clues for us. Right. Um, and a lot of this goes back to the gut, right? So if, if we, the gut is the source of all nutrients. So whatever foods or supplements you're putting in your body, that gets, the gut is responsible for breaking that down. And then we have nutrient absorption that's happening. So oftentimes people will have low T4 and low T3 and automatically they get put on a medication. When really, if we just fix the gut and we improved nutrient delivery, T4 and T3 would automatically come up, right? And then we would also have the nutrients needed for conversion. And there's a large majority of thyroid medication that is actually, or excuse me, thyroid hormone that is converted in the gut. So having good gut health is also important for conversion of T4 to T3. Having good liver health is also important to, of conversion of um, T4 to T3. That's another area where a large majority of it is converted. And then related to um, kidney stones. So when I think kidney stones, I think accumulation of calcium and that's just a sign, another sign of inflammation. So there's natural ways that you can go about preventing kidney stones, but ultimately it comes back to reversing kind of the chaos that's going on and reversing inflammation overall, um, which will prevent kidney stones from happening. Like my clients that I work with, they never have, they might've come to me with kidney stones, but after that, they never have them anymore. So does that answer your question? Yes, I've been feeling like it's been a gut issue and not a necessarily a kidney issue. Yeah. Yeah. You're, trust your intuition, girl. <laughs> I'm going to get what, I'm going to get what you, girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We'll definitely be talking about that for sure. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? I think you guys can like raise your hands maybe. Let's see, Anne's still on here. 
any other questions that you guys have. I think, and you can unmute yourself if you have questions too, or type them in. I'll wait just another minute or so. Just if you have any questions, let me know. But um, I can talk to you for two hours. Are you kidding? <laughs> I can fill. I want to give someone else a chance to talk, but I can fill your hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, nobody's raising their hands or anything, so. If you have another question, I mean, I'm happy. Maybe we can take another five minutes if you have other questions, Jess, because whatever you have questions about, I'm sure everybody else can learn from it too. Well, I'm not looking for my free consultation yet. However, uh, giving you an, an idea of this, I can tell you that dietary wise, I was thrown into a complete tizzy by trying to have a healthy diet and then trying to follow a low oxalate diet. Oh, that yeah. is an absolute nightmare because on the oxalate side, they want you to eat like all the worst food. It makes no sense, all this healthy food. So when you spoke about not healthy enough for you, and especially quinoa, and I just bought quinoa because I thought that was my next alternative. And then I looked at the list. So needless to say, the frustration level with, wow, I'm eating healthy food is very troubling and sort of trying to get to, um, you know, an autoimmune protocol for something like thyroid and kidney stones together when you know you need to clean out your gut. Yeah. And know that that's the thing. And candida albicans, is that how you say it? Yeah. Al like I've been fighting those, getting those down for years. Those are brutal to get, to, to, to get the levels down. It was over 250 or something last time I checked. Yep. Totally. Yeah. So I see Nora has her hand up, so I'm gonna, I have a comment to make on that. Jess and then Nora, I'm gonna bring you on. Um, so it's now that you bring up oxalates, that correlates with the kidney stone question because high oxalates in the body. And you guys, just so you know, oxalates are something that there's certain foods that have high oxalates in them. Our body also produces oxalates, but we should be able to get rid of them. And when we can't, when there's oxalate accumulation that happens in the body, it's like little pieces of, uh, glass like shards that go in and cut up tissue so it can become very painful for people um, but so what can contribute to high oxalates in the body is eating high oxalate foods but candida heavy metals and low minerals are also components of having high oxalates and we can see that so one of the tests that I sometimes run is an organic acids test and we can see um, systemic candida we can see oxalate values and like we we'll talk about that too. So we'll talk about that when we do your little. Bit. Yep. Cool. Um, so let's see, Nora. I think Nora, you're on the line. I'm gonna mute you, Jess. Nora, are you there? Nora, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for your webinar. I know that this is spending a lot of time giving so much of your heart towards other people and your desire to help them. Um, mine is just kind of more a general question. I'm, I'm a registered dietitian. I have a lot of clients who I believe your word was chaos, metabolic chaos. And I just love that word. I work with a lot of low income clients who have complete metabolic chaos. And as a dietitian, I'm so fascinated by how I think that the HPA axis is really off in a lot of most of them. And a lot of these things are a result of, and I'm constantly harping on the inflammation component of it. Mm -hmm. And other than, you know, simple dietary um, recommendations that I always make, just really trying to find the right diet for them that fits not only their budget and everything. But um, I just wondered if you could speak to like simple things that you do. I mean, as health professionals, we're always asked, you know, on the street questions all the time, like, hey, what should I do about this? And, you know, I have my standard response that I give people. But um, as I go forward and I try to really help people undercover, like uncover what these sources of inflammation are, there's no way we can take someone with a 30-year medical history who you know is low income or whatever, and really <laughs> say, oh hey, what about if you do this three hundred dollar Dutch test or whatever? Mm -hmm. How do you go about just uh, other than like you know low inflammatory diet? Like, what are some other things that you really try to help you know on the street people with? Yeah, so diet, um, diet obviously a big 
component, as you know, and uh, <clears throat> the other pieces of the puzzle. So this comes from my training in functional diagnostic nutrition, and I would love to share more about that with you so you can, I can send you some information on that. But when uh, in that training, we are taught to look at, it's called the DRESS for Health Success Protocol. So DRESS stands for diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, and supplementation, proper supplementation. So you already got the diet part is what you do mostly. Um, when I work with people, I would say that aside from diet, sleep is the number one other issue that they're having that contributes to this whole chaos that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, we have our circadian. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, we have our circadian rhythm. There's certain ideal yeah. times that we should be sleeping. So I work on correcting their sleep habits first and getting yeah. them to value sleep as much as they do exercise and diet. Um, I will, you know, kind of, forming my impression about the person and how much stress that their body is under, I oftentimes will have them dial back their exercise because I think that they're pushing themselves too hard and not allowing their body, their body can't recover from it, especially if they're nutrient deficient, right? Right, definitely. And then, um, I integrate a lot of stress reducing techniques. So I have them get into a meditation routine or deep right. eating and that kind of stuff. And then we yep. sort out environmental toxins. And I would say that that's another really big uh, stress that most people don't, don't think about. So I have like a toxins checklist that we go through in their home and their work environment. And then they right. slowly start to make changes where they can't, obviously with low income, um, they can't go out and like re get, redo all their cleaning products. So I'm like, well, when exactly. cleaning products get new ones, but when you start to educate them on the significant impacts that endocrine disrupting chemicals, particularly like, you know, chlorine in your water binds thyroid hormone and makes it unavailable. So I have them save up and they spend $50 on getting a shower filter, you know, yeah. as soon as they can. And we, the simple changes that they can start to make in their environment um, is what's going to sustain the results long term, right? So, and then yeah, that's really good. I mean, I think all those things you mentioned, I really hit on. We the first meeting, we always talk about sleep. That I mean, it's it's almost astounding the number of clients I see who completely don't get the right kind of sleep and don't get enough sleep. And yeah. so, yeah, completely. It, that's really helpful. I just wanted to make sure I was on the right track because I know as medicine moves forward we are going to have to address the whole person. And as a dietitian, I always am trying to bring in all the information I can possibly gather to make good recommendations. And we're, you know, dietitians are always at fault for giving, or, or they can be at fault for giving one-sided advice without looking at the full picture. So yeah, that's, um, that's really helpful that I just wanted to make sure like, okay, am I on the right track? Is this, you know, really helping? And um, I, I think that, you know, what you said, the dress, like I hit all of those all the time. So yeah. I would say that the, uh, probably the other, really the biggest healing opportunity that I see is when it comes to the gut function. So I'm always running a stool sample test and okay. it comes back with something in there are. So I use, um, diagnostic solutions, their GI map test yeah. and can be partially uncovered by insurance. Okay. Um, so that's really helpful, but those, you know, going back to identifying stress that they have, parasites, bacteria, yeast overgrowth, then those things are causing internal stress, right? And you can, right. you can make an a educated guess and, and try to do some targeted supplements or therapies, but right. each type of um, uh, gut bug is different. Each species is different. And so if you don't know what you're dealing with, you can be missing the mark and then they're spending su money on supplements that aren't actually working for them. I mean, right. that's where I get one of my biggest pet peeves is seeing all this stuff about candida and like, there's all these candida cleanses. And I'm like, you guys, candida is an opportunistic fungus that is there because it's growing off of something else. So if there's candida, there's typically a parasite and bacteria and you, you actually get rid of the parasite and the bacteria, the candida will go away on its own. Right. Growing on top of something else. So I think that right. there was money to be spent somewhere um, and like they have zero funds, like a stool sample test is where I would be putting my money all the time. That's good. Okay. 
Cool. Good question. Great. Any Thank other you. questions? I know we're like, oh my gosh, almost 90 minutes here. Right? I tried to keep it short. <laughs> I just, there's so much information to share. Well, you guys have been totally wonderful. I love sharing this information. Like I said, I'll send out the recording um, probably on Thursday, so I need to download everything. Uh, if you have additional questions, want to set up a consultation, you can do that here. Pin me on Instagram, on Facebook. I love to chat with you guys. And I and share this, please, with your friends and family. Like, let's spread the word so that nobody has to suffer, right? Everybody can be healthy and get the results that they want to. So please feel free to share the recording with um, whoever you think would find it useful. So, all right, you guys, have a great evening, and I'll see you, I don't know, sometime soon, maybe. <laughs>